New cars are better than old ones. They're more economical, faster, more powerful, more comfortable, safer. New cars are just better. And here's why I'm slowly growing to hate pretty much all of them. Hello you lot, Miller Corner here, welcome back once again. And today we're doing something a little bit different because we're taking a break from rebuilding the Super Sacento because unfortunately I'm still waiting on some parts and I can't yet film any videos with my new bike because I'm waiting on some stuff to be able to film with that as well. So at the moment, I'm kind of waiting on other people entirely. Sorry about that. So for something a little bit different, for the last few weeks for work, I've been driving around in a pretty much brand new Ford Galaxy People carrier. Over the last few weeks of driving hundreds of miles and spending a lot of time in the Galaxy, I've learned a lot of things about not just it, but most new cars in general. A lot of features, a lot of quirks, a lot of personality traits they have, and a lot of things about new cars in general that are putting me off of them. And it's one of the reasons why, just lately, I haven't had much enthusiasm for most new cars. Given the choice of any new car, I can find an older one which I'd rather have. For a start, you get information overload in new cars. In the Galaxy, for example, there's a little screen in between the rev counter and the speedometer which shows you your current speed, a bit redundant when there's a speedometer, your fuel economy, your real-time fuel economy, your distance to an empty tank. The more information the manufacturers put on screens in the instrument cluster or on the dashboard and distract people's eyes generally away from looking out the windscreen where they should be looking, the more likely they are to crash from not looking where they're going. It just seems ridiculously unsafe to throw all this information at you, most of which you don't need. We didn't need it in older cars, why should we get it in newer ones? It's pretty much redundant information that no one is asking for. Some modern cars have even got the ability to connect to your social media feed. What? If I'm driving, I want to be driving, I want to be looking where I'm going and concentrating on getting where I want to go safely. I don't want to be reading my Twitter. There's even a little bit in the screen in the Galaxy that tells you what gear to be in. It will tell you to change up or change down at a certain point in the rev range, presumably for fuel economy. Shut up! It's this and loads of other stuff you see on your screens everywhere, which is just deeply frustrating to have in modern cars, because what it means is you spend more and more time and physical effort looking at things other than what you should be looking at, which is the windscreen and the road in front of you to actually see where you're going and avoid hitting things. And unfortunately, it's not just the excess of information we get in modern cars, it's also the excess of buttons and controls. Look at pretty much any car made in the last five years and it looks like someone has shoved a load of buttons in their mouth and nose and then just sneezed everywhere. There are buttons and switches and controls everywhere on every surface barring the glass and every single one you need to be concentrating on, you need to be looking at to actually know what it does because most of them aren't shaped like traditional controls. For example, if you want to move the wing mirrors around in the Galaxy, you want to adjust the glass, most cars or older cars with electric door mirrors, you move the stick to the left or to the right for which glass you want to control and then you twiddle the stick to actually control the position of the glass. In the Galaxy, there are two switches. You press the left switch to control the left glass and the right switch to control the right glass. That just seems like two extra unnecessary buttons that you're not going to know what they do without looking at them, hence you've got to take your eyes off the road more. And it's not even just buttons. The amount of cars these days that have massive infotainment touchscreens that do your navigation, your media, your climate control, all that kind of stuff in one big screen is pretty much every new car you can buy that costs more than about 10 grand and the Galaxy was no exception to that and what it meant was I had a screen with all this information and all these controls in it that I had to keep looking over at to see what I was doing, how to control everything and I couldn't just reach over and press a button. If I want to control where the air's blowing in the climate control I've got a knob for example just down here and all I've got to do without even looking I'll do it now that's windscreen. I didn't even have to look at it. That's feet, that's feet and windscreen. It doesn't, it doesn't take any effort at all. I don't have to think about it. I just know to turn it. In most modern cars where the climate control is in the touch screen, you actually have to look at it because you've got to look over, go into a menu and another sub menu and another sub menu to then press a button and decide where you want your air to be going. And of course, there is no physical feedback because it's a touch screen. So you have to be constantly looking at the screen to see what you're pressing and where you're going. All it means is you spend ever more time looking down there and not up 
up there where you should be to actually see where you're bloody well going. In most modern cars, there's buttons for two separate climate zones for the driver and the passenger. A lot of the stuff is hidden in the infotainment screens. You have to spend valuable time when you should be driving, looking at that screen, going into menu one, sub menu two, sub menu three, sub menu four. And I'm sure it makes sense when you're standing still and I'm watching a Doug DeMuro video, but when you're actually driving along, it doesn't because you can't do it quickly. And unlike with a switch where I can kind of, even if I'm not looking at it, I can feel the switch is there. That's the switch I want. I just turn it on a touch screen. There's no physical feedback. So I have to look and see what I'm doing, where I'm pressing and what I'm actually controlling. It just means I spend more and more time distracted and less and less time concentrating on driving the car, looking where I'm going and getting where I want to get to safely, which primarily is the whole point of a car journey. Every little thing from changing where the air's blowing on the climate control system to adjusting where the door mirrors are to get rid of your blind spots is just too complicated and too hard to do without looking where you're going. If it's a blind spot, I want to get rid of it. I want to press a button and go, right, that's gone. I don't want to be looking at, oh, that's my driver's side mirror. And that's to press up and press down. Because by the time I've actually got rid of the blind spot, I'm now blind in my eyes because I've crashed and I've got a tree impaled in my face. Talking about blind spots, that brings up another problem that I have with most new cars. And that is to do with the thickness of the pillars and the visibility that you don't get as a result. I know new cars have come on leaps and bounds in terms of safety in even the last 10 years. And I know that part of that is to make pillars thicker so they can give more strength to the car. And of course, so they can pack a million airbags into them. What you get is this enormous A pillar blocking out pretty much everything in your right eye's peripheral vision. You go and look at any car made in even the last five years. And what you get are these massive, massive pillars here, obviously to give the car strength and probably to pack some kind of cool curtain airbag in it. But nonetheless, the thick pillars I can kind of see a point to. One feature in modern cars that I definitely can't see a point to, and I don't think pretty much anyone can, is the demon, the big one, the evil little button on the dashboard that we all hate. I'm talking, of course, about the electronic handbrake. The electronic handbrake is the most stupid, redundant, worthless feature ever to be fitted to a car because it doesn't actually help anything. How hard is it to grab hold of a button, grab hold of a lever and pull it up about four or five inches? How hard was that? No one ever complained about putting a handbrake on. Even on old cars, even on cars from like the 60s and the 70s where handbrakes are a little bit tougher to get on. No one ever complained about that. But someone somewhere in a board meeting went, hmm, I wonder how we can automate that. Why? What was, the, what was the motivation for the electronic handbrake? What was the brief? Let's take something really simple that works easily and faultlessly and has done for decades and make it no stronger and no more efficient, but make it easier to break and more expensive to break? That's all I can think is that when it breaks, because they do, you then have to take it back to the manufacturer and pay hundreds if not thousands of pounds to get the damn thing working again. I don't know, it could be me because I like simple old school cars like the Sargento, but I never fully trust electric handbrakes. You pull up to a set of lights, you pull the switch up to put the electronic handbrake on, and you go, okay, it's on. So you take your foot off the brake, and if you take your foot off the clutch, and you put the car in neutral, obviously, you then don't have to do anything. Natural instinct then says that to pull away from those lights, you then have to put the car back into gear, then put your hand down for the handbrake, and then you can pull away. But no, pretty much every electronic handbrake in every modern car will take itself off if you go to drive away forwards, which, can be a little bit disconcerting to think that it can take itself off without you provoking it. I know it knows what it's doing and I'm sure it's a perfectly capable and perfectly safe system that it will take itself off just so you can quickly and easily get away from a set of lights on a hill start or whatever, but I don't know, there's a little bit of me that says a system that you put on yourself, you should take off yourself as well, because that way you know it's on, you know it's off. There might well be a time that you want to pull away and there's that little bit of your brain that goes, what if it doesn't go off? And we might break something, burn out the motors or something like that. And equally, there's that little part of your brain that says, what if I pull this switch to put the electronic handbrake on and it doesn't come on? What if it doesn't work? What if I can't hold the car on the handbrake because the electronic motors or whatever the hell it is that makes the thing work decides not to one day? There's that little bit of your brain, that little bit of imagination that goes, if this doesn't work, I'm completely screwed. And to be honest, that is my big bugbear with electronic handbrakes. You never really know how far you can trust them. And 
For what benefit? What advantage is there of an electronic handbrake over a mechanical one? And don't go thinking that it letting itself off is consistent either, because I found out that it lets itself off automatically if it's on when you go to pull away forwards, but if you go to reverse, it doesn't. The handbrake doesn't turn itself off if you go to reverse. So I was sitting there with the car with its ass up in the air as I was letting the clutch out, and I kept waiting for it to disengage, and it kept telling me, E handbrake engaged. So wait, so hang on, so you're intelligent enough to work out that when I'm going forwards, with the clutch pulling out, and with the car in gear, I kind of probably want the electronic handbrake off, and I want to go forwards, but if I'm trying to do the same thing in reverse, you're not intelligent enough to work out that with the car in reverse, that you physically have to lift a collar to engage, and with me lifting the clutch up to do it, I don't necessarily want to go in reverse. Electronic handbrakes are one example of technology for the sake of technology. Another example is electronic boot lids. Who thought that was a good idea? For those of you that don't know what I'm on about, an electronic boot lid, or tailgate as you might call it, is basically a little button on your car's boot lid that will close it automatically. So you park up, you load your car up with stuff, you press a button, and a little electric motor will go meee and close the boot lid itself. But they are so slow! How long does it realistically take to close a boot lid? Two seconds! Grab it, slam it. Easy peasy. But no, an electronic boot lid is about an hour and a half, meh, buzzing itself down. And because obviously they don't want people suing because it's destroyed their shopping or beheaded their dog, it has to have hundreds of little sensors in it that kind of detect if there's anything that's going to be in the way when it closes. And if anything were to move, for example, you've stacked your shopping a bit funny and one of the bags kind of fell over a little bit, it will think, oh, that could be a child or a dog, and it will stop halfway down on its hour and a half journey and slowly whiz back up again so as not to crush your French stick in the boot. Yeah, if you've got an electronic tailgate on your car, you're stuck with it. When I was up filming with JM on cars a few months back, I was also meeting up with his mate, also called James, who's got a Porsche Macan Turbo, which is generally a car that I actually like. We went out for dinner in it, and it's a really cool car. I put my rucksack with all my camera gear in the boot of the car. I reached up to slam the boot lid, and he said, oh, no, 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 you've got to press the button to close it. I said, can you not just close it? He goes, oh no, you can't close it by hand because it will burn the motors out and they're about a grand to replace. S sorry, what? So I have to wait for this really slow system to close the boot lid and if I have it, I can't just close it myself or else it will cost me the value of a Seicento to repair it? What? But here's the thing, all this technology and all this gadgetry and all this disconnection from the driving experience is my main problem with modern cars. I don't want to be one of these rose-tinted, spectacled old farts that says, oh, things were better in the old days, but they were. These days, as I said, driving a car isn't for the fun of it. Most people who drive a car drive it to get from A to B. It's their tool, it's a box to get them from where they are to where they need to be for work or whatever. And the problem with that is there's so much technology and so much extra engineering that goes in to make it as pleasant but not enjoyable as possible. I drove over a hundred miles in that galaxy in one day and when I got back to where this was parked to drive home, I jumped out of this big, comfortable, air-conditioned, smooth, quiet, well-insulated bus with fantastic comfort and a brilliant stereo, it must be said, into this little rattly box that was bouncing around in the road and was making a load of noise and revving up and there was more road noise and I was bouncing around all the speed bumps. It was, by comparison, a lot less pleasant of an experience to spend time with. But which one made me smile while I was doing it? Which one was the enjoyable commute? It was this one. It was the one that was by far and away less pleasant. I was less comfortable, I was less air conditioned, the music wasn't nearly as good through nearly as nice of a stereo, and I was having to be a lot more alert through what I was doing. But I was enjoying it. It was a much more kind of raw experience. Cars these days aren't designed, for the most part, to be enjoyable to drive, they're designed to be easy to drive. If you know how to change gear, you can drive pretty much any modern car in hell. Most of them, you don't even need to be able to change gear because the vast majority of them are paddle shift or automatic. 
And the problem with that is they make modern cars incredibly capable, but not necessarily enjoyable. One of the fastest hot hatchbacks you can buy is the Audi S3, and it is a fantastically capable car. Two litre turbocharged engine, it's got launch control, it's got quattro, and you can have it with the seven speed DSG double clutch gearbox. So it is lightning fast off the line, is ridiculously grippy through the corners, it will launch itself to 60 in well under five seconds, and you can change gear in milliseconds. It's a fantastically capable car, and as a daily driver, for the money, I don't think there are many better cars than an Audi S3. However, how many people say, oh, I love my S3, it's so exciting, it's so enjoyable to drive? They don't. There's so much technology in it, from its e-handbrake to its quattro four-wheel drive to its double-clutch gearbox, that make it so detached. It's like one of these martial arts guys that's incredibly capable. They'll chop through 10 layers of Argos catalogs or a brick or whatever it is they chop through, and then when they're finished, they've just got this blank expression on their face, like, yeah, but, yeah, I do that. You don't get the sense that they're proud of themselves or that they enjoyed it, they just do it. Now, I'm well aware that much of my argument here has stemmed from my drive in a Ford Galaxy, which is, at the end of the day, a family people carrier, and it's not designed for drivers. It's not a driver's car. But the Galaxy is far from the only car to do what it does. It's just a great example of technology in modern cars being too much giving us too much. Even if you detract how little actual driving you have to do in a modern car, it takes away from their character. The Audi S3, for example, it doesn't really have a character. It's just a box that goes fast and looks good. There's not much character. There's not much smile going on. It doesn't enjoy itself because it's so flawless and so efficient at what it does. It's a brilliant car, but I don't want one. By comparison, I really want a little of R595 because they've got so much character, they're so flawed actually. It's not hard to spin up the wheels even in first and second gear just driving around town. They bounce, they tram line, they're badly made, they're rattly, they're impractical, but they've got character. What I'm trying to say here is modern cars are fantastic, make no mistake about that. They are brilliantly capable and there's a very, very good case to be made for only ever having new cars and having the latest technology to make your daily driving as easy and relaxing as possible. But it comes at the expense of character, of enjoyment, of actually getting involved with it. And what it means is you get out of a new car with all this technology, you get in an old car and you might struggle to use it because you're so used to the car doing everything for you. The art of driving is something to be enjoyed, not endured. We should be preserving it. We should be taking away all this unnecessary crap like electronic handbrakes and touchscreen climate controls and automatic boot lids and giving people what they need and nothing more. That's why I love the Seicento. That's why I love most older cars from the kind of 80s, 90s and early 2000s. They gave you the best they could at the time, but that's the sweet spot. It's new enough to be usable, but not so new that you're getting bombarded with switches and buttons and touch screens and flashing lights. It's usable and it's practical and it's dailyable, but it preserves the character and it most definitely preserves you still getting involved with it. New cars are better than old cars in a great many ways, make no mistake about that, but for me, it's old school all the way.